this is one that I wanted to flag for this week, and this is our kind of tactical segment for the week. A good friend of ours, Jiho, aka Jeff, who heads up growth and is part of the Axie kind of founding team, he published a Web3 growth playbook. And I think this is super high value for anyone who is kind of trying to get from zero to one in anything related to Web3 gaming or kind of expand that to any sort of Web3 consumer facing product overall. So this is, I would say it's only about 20 minute read or so. And I would say this is like required reading for anyone working in Web3 gaming. We will link to the article in the show notes, but I did put together some of my favorite takeaways from this, as well as I would say my review or sort of like critiques or at the least like opportunities of kind of like what I think is not really addressed in Axie's historical playbook with the caveat of like, you know, who, who am I <laughs> compared to like what they've achieved. So why is Jiho's Axie Growth playbook required reading for marketers? So Web3 gaming is getting a little more mature now. So it got a lot of issues, but I think it's taken for granted how much of the current jargon, the tactics, the things that we do as Web3 marketers all originated with Axie. So play to earn as a concept, I largely credit that as coming with Axie. I and mean, that's essentially become ubiquitous and iterated on since then. The idea of scholarships within Web3 gaming of like one person owning the asset, somebody else being the player that was born with Axie. And then even more like nerdy growth marketer things like Axie is the first company I've known that has a public, at least used to, I haven't checked it lately, but they have a publicly available Google sheet that is essentially like their growth marketing dashboards and all of their metrics around growth marketing that anyone can pull up and reference. So I think Axie has innovated in a number of ways that get trashed on a lot, but as we always say, you know, first to market is first to fail as well. So that's a little context for why I think it's important to, to learn from their learnings. What is covered in this? So there's, like I said, it's about 20 minute read. We go through topics like incentive alignment, uh, referral systems, working with UGC and creators, how to set up goal structure, how to build community, how to build an elevator pitch, the role of data in marketing. Read the article. I'm not going to sum it all here, but I wanted to call out a couple of my favorite points in here and things that we really agree with here at Uptick. The first thing was on the topic of UGC slash KOLs or influencers. This is something that almost every team in Web3 Gaming and really all game marketing teams are concerned with and want to do, but almost no one does it effectively. So here's a little excerpt from that section. Uh, when it comes to creators, the current meta seems to be spending a ton with KOLs with large reach. I believe this is mostly flawed thinking. Where we're contrarian here is that we believe in the power of micro-influencers. These up-and-coming creators may have less followers, but their dedication is often higher. For this archetype, when Moku did research on what they wanted, their primary goal was actually recognition and help with distribution of their content. Be very generous with retweeting and highlighting the content that your community makes. It becomes a virtuous cycle. If a creator makes content and isn't recognized, they'll often go to an ecosystem that better values their talents or gives them more white glove treatment. So that's Jiho's comments. My notes on this. Absolutely agree with this. When people are working with KOLs or influencers or content creators, just go back to like the fundamental concept of eCPM. You should not care about the specific reach of the content creator. You should care about the value of each relative impression that you are paying for or working with them on. And to the second and more important point here, 99% of content creators are the ones that are struggling to grow their brand. They care about that way more if they're a serious content creator than making a few hundred bucks to post a piece of content. And if you can show that you actually value them as a partner, that you're going to highlight the content they create, they will reward you by being more dedicated, making better content, and being a better advocate for you. We've seen this several times with some larger ecosystems that we've worked with where they have like these paid creator programs, they're paying people to be essentially on retainer and post content, and they don't even resurface it from the main accounts of that product. This is like completely going against everything you should be doing. Again, like if you are rewarding the content creator with highlighting them and helping them grow, you don't have to compensate all of that with money. If the only thing that a content creator is getting out of it is a financial transaction with you, they're going to treat it the same way on their end. Another thing that we've been doing here at Uptake to kind of expand on this is we're trying to create more of like a creator mentorship program where outside of like premium KOLs and content creators, for the games that we cover, we're going to be working more and more with smaller up and coming content creators where our games are not going to be paying for their content directly, but more that we're going to be providing mentorship, endorsements, and things like that in exchange for them covering some of the games that we work on. These are the kind of things that might not yield dividends the day that the creator posts things, but as you build relationships with content creators long term, become very valuable. The second thing that I really liked was Jiho's comments on structuring work and how thinking about goals and process. So this is kind of meta, but a quote on this. As a 
community or a growth person, kickstarting community is daunting. You'll want to both set outcome and process goals for yourself. What's the difference between these? An outcome goal is typically a number. A process goal is what you actually do. For example, you might set an outcome goal of 10,000 followers, but what's actually important is how to get there. For example, you can commit to tweeting 10 times a day for 100 days. And then he goes on to give an example of how you would structure goals and process for a Web3 growth team. So this is super important. Sounds obvious, but like it's something that we found working with teams repeatedly. Sometimes you get on an initial call with a team and you're like, cool, what's the business goal right now? Or what's the KPI? And that, that's a great question. What do you think it should be? And it's like, these are things that, that are obvious, but we started at Uptick just sort of literally putting on when we do our decks with our clients, like putting the goal, current business goal in the upper right-hand corner and of every page that we present just so we're always working towards that North Star. And yeah, the idea that like a goal is not, you know, post 100 tweets, like that's a, that's a process. So separating out those tool, but it being aligned on both. So I thought that was great. And then the last thing I want to cover here is Jiho calls this gifting. I would reframe it for what we call as partnerships marketing, but it's essentially like creating incentives for your ideal user cohorts to bring them into the ecosystem. So the quotes from Jiho here, we announced a partnership with Decentraland. As part of the announcement, we started to give out free axes to anyone with land in Decentraland. This was a mass onboarding event that attracted some of our most fervent early supporters and attracted critical mass for our, our upcoming land sale. Use targeted giveaways to onboard players from other projects. This works most effectively once there is some utility or gameplay loop already in place. Partnered communities are a great target for this type of approach. So again, we call this more partnerships marketing on Uptick side. But yeah, what is the goal of partnerships marketing? It's to find your ideal customer or community member and reward them or incentivize them for joining your ecosystem. This can be done through giveaways, incentives of different types, collaborations of different types. There's a lot to this and I won't get into that here. But the, the theme of this is like finding your ideal user and giving them some sort of white glove or rewarded treatment for coming into your ecosystem. And then the last thing that I'll just touch on quickly, he calls this discord grinding, but really what he goes into is how to develop a voice as a project founder or leader within your community. And he talks about like, what are the type of things you should be posting about? What is the frequency? And there's a lot of good tips here for basically as a project founder, how to interact with your Web3 community. Before going to my kind of critiques and feedback on the playbook. Xander, did you get a chance to read the thread? Any thoughts on the Axie playbook? Yeah, I've read the thread. I think you covered it in pretty intense depth, so I don't need to rehash it. I do want to call it a couple of things that we've talked about in the past with Jiho and Axie Infinity in particular, which I think are really interesting and important. I think the most interesting thing that I think he's ever said to me is he looked at growing Axie Infinity like a political movement, which is something that I've never really heard any other games marketer say. And it, you would see in the techniques that he's articulating in his vision, these are political movement type inspirational methodologies and messaging, which I think if you think about it in that context, it makes it really understandable how he's doing what he's doing. There's also this old axiom in Maxim in Silicon Valley, which is do things that don't scale. And some of my favorite stories about Jiho in his early days were how he would manually onboard whales into their ecosystem. And my favorite story about this is where he flew to the Philippines to personally onboard Gabby from YGG into the ecosystem by like literally sitting him down and teaching how to use a wallet. And like that kind of stuff is like insanely unscalable, right? You can't have your, your founders flying to a country to onboard people, but it shows the methodology of like, you just, you have to grind, you have to grind, you have to grind. And that gets to this massive outsized return. I think the process piece that you highlighted is really, really important. This is something that we talk, I've talked about with my team internally. Having a playbook for what you do every day when you wake up in the morning is really important. This is especially true for really, really tedious jobs like SDRs where you have to send a bunch of emails. And in a lot of ways, what they're doing here is going to be very, very similar. You're trying to drum up organic interest by spending a lot of time pounding pavement. And I think last but not least, we've talked about the importance of influencer marketing and partnerships marketing. What I would say is they were the godfathers of these tactics. And I think they continue to work very, very well in the Web3 native space. Now, the question I have, and I'm sure you'll touch on this, is what's the next step? Well, the interesting thing is, I think we've seen what the next step is, and it's not Axie, it's Ronin. I think what this playbook is an amazing resource for is going from zero to one as a Web3 business. And Axie has done that in, I think, in an unparalleled way. But I do think that there is a bit of a local maximum that you hit with these strategies. Like the strategy from getting from one to 100 is often very different from the strategy to from getting zero to one. Here at Uptick these days is we're kind of cresting like the 40 employee-ish number and seeing some things that break down at this size or some things that we can't or more difficult to scale with with our work and our, our software and our clients. So what did Axie do? Like there's a few different explorations that they've done here. We had the pleasure of working with Axie and some of their mobile free to play test launch. And what we found, you know, without disclosing any data or anything is that like people really wanted to join Axie and we can get them in the game very effectively. 
but it was really hitting a wall with onboarding those users to Web3 and fully jumping into the ecosystem. And I think that that's something that Axie hasn't totally solved for yet. But in the meantime, I think they've been looking, well, okay, we're really good at going from zero to one. How can we scale zero to one? And that's what they're doing with Ronin. So what we're seeing with Ronin is these games build on Ronin or migrate to Ronin. And they have this massive incentive that they can go from literal close to zero users to hundreds of thousands in almost no time. And it's by replicating this kind of playbook and these kind of incentive structures and working with UGC and content creators, some of the things that the Jiho spells out here. So it's kind of brilliant because they're essentially like scaling a zero to one strategy rather than going from one to 100, they're multiplying applying the that one 100 times so i think that's really smart as like a medium term strategy but i do think in my main critique and growth opportunity for axie is it's such a tiny part of the addressable market of gamers that any game in the ronin ecosystem is able to address because of the barriers that still prevent you from getting into kind of the heart and soul of a lot of these games and i do expect that they're going to evolve and address that but that's kind of my main critique and it's it's more so of like what is not said what is not addressed in this playbook so that's i think the main opportunity that actually needs to figure out how to best capitalize on next we did a really interesting podcast with the CEO or the, one of the founders of Aperon a few weeks ago. We can link that in the podcast. They built a game, spent half a decade on it, and they migrated onto the Ronin chain. And they talked about how the mechanism of using the Ronin ecosystem to get hundreds of thousands of users really, really quickly has worked for them. And it's a really interesting specific use case of the thing we're talking about now. And we can link that in the description. Overall, I mean, these guys are some of the best in the world at the Web3 Games ecosystem. They have taken a bit of a different tack. They're really focusing on pressing that advantage. And I think that's a little bit different than we're seeing with some of the other players in the ecosystem overall. One thing that, like, you've talked to someone like Atif at Third Web, how he's really about growing the pie and how do we make sure everyone's happy. And the business is different. They're an infrastructure play, right? So they need as many people on it as possible. That's where they make the money. Jiho is really focused on his cohort, right? He cares a lot about the Ronin. He wants to do everything for everyone within his ecosystem. And he's less worried about what's happening on the other blockchains. It's like, really, how do we make sure that we are the premier place for games within our ecosystem and keeping everyone uh, together and happy and uh, successful? I mean, they've gone through so much tumult. I mean, we forget that they got $600 million stolen from them by North Korea, right? Like these guys are just survivors and they really are some of the best just grinding it out and making things happen. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good point, Xander. And that's something I didn't call out. But one section of the playbook is about interviewing your community members and how to learn from your community members by interviewing them. And I think that really feeds into the strength of this playbook, which is, I think this is part of what you're saying, Xander, like really owning a customer segment or community and hearing their needs catering to them, giving them the product they dream of. There is another side of that coin, though, which is not to say that's wrong. It's more that there is a tension. What your enfranchised players want is often very different, sometimes literally opposite of what will most value a net new person to the ecosystem. And franchise players crave complexity and nuance and new deeper things to explore. And that really pushes against approachability and top of funnel and the idea that anyone can join the game at any time and join and have a meaningful experience. So I think that's the, not that you should not interview your core community members. Absolutely you should. I think you just also need to take that perspective of they will have very different and opposing desires than what a net new person to your ecosystem might have. And that's not a Ronin lesson. That's a Web3 lesson. And broadly, that's a gaming lesson. It's a gaming lesson. <laughs> it's just a product lesson, right? <laughs> Cool. That's it. Take us out. Thanks, everyone, for joining us once again for the weekly news episode here on the Games Growth Podcast. As always, the pod was brought to you by our team at Uptick. You probably know this by now, but at Uptick, we do Games Growth. We do all the work and build all the software needed to scale games profitably. So if you're building a cool game and need good folks to help you scale that profitably, reach us through our website. That's uptick.com, U-P-P-T-I-C.com. Talk soon.